Hello, everyone. This is uh, Michael Hogue with the American Pharmacists Association, and we welcome you to this week's presentation addressing the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, this is an open forum webinar for pharmacists. This is week two of these weekly forums, and we intend to continue to do these week by week uh, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I want to again acknowledge all of the hard work of pharmacists, student pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, and uh, appreciate everything that you're doing day in and day out to care for your communities. We appreciate that and we thank you for that. Uh, I want to remind you all that today's webinar is being audio recorded and it will be available to you uh, within 24 hours at pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 resources section. I also want to point out to you that if you look at the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen toward the bottom, you'll notice that there's a tab called handouts. There are two handouts available for you for today. The first is a uh, PDF of some links from week one. There were a number of resources and links that participants last week wanted to have access to in a more easy format. So we've provided that to you as a PDF so you can access those links. And then secondly, as a PDF of the slides that we're gonna be using today, if you want to have those for future reference and print them off, we'll also provide a copy of those on our webpage as well, but just wanted you to know that. Now, I'm the, uh, happy to host and moderate today's uh, webinar as the president of the American Pharmacists Association, but I'm even more pleased to be joined by some real experts in this field. First of all, we're going to today talk about uh, primarily focus on uh, this uh, issue of COVID-19 testing. We received over the last week literally dozens of calls from pharmacists and, and lots of different uh, messages from pharmacists about uh, emails and uh, uh, various faxes and things that they were getting about the COVID-19 testing and some what's real and what's not. And we wanted to just parse that out for you today. So we're going to be joined by uh, Elisa Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is on the staff as Senior Vice President of Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs at APHA but she was on the staff of the Food and Drug Administration of FDA for many, many years. And so she has a rich career in understanding FDA's procedures. We're gonna hear from her today. I also wanna tell you, I'm very excited today that we have joining us, uh, Dr. Lisa Kunin. Dr. Kunin is uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have some late breaking news, folks, for you today that Dr. Kunin is going to be sharing with you about uh, the, the CDC's guidance for pharmacists. And she's joined our call here today to help share that information with you. And so we're excited to get to that. And then also we're happy again to be joined by Dr. Dan Zlot, uh, former NIH uh, clinical pharmacist and now APHA staffer who's vice president of our professional education division. And he will be answering your clinical questions as they come up. So today we're going to follow essentially the same format that we followed last week. We're going to uh, spend a few minutes this morning talking about the testing issues. Uh, we're going to talk about the CDC's late breaking news. Um, and then we're going to open up the lines for Q&A. And so for today, when we'll give you some instructions on how that Q&A goes. But just for the moment, let me tell you that there's a there is an opportunity for you to submit questions in writing, and we'd ask that you do that, that you type out your questions. We'll go through those questions and categorize them, and at that the appropriate time, I will call on you by name, and the staff will unmute your line in order for you to be able to speak. So without any further ado, uh, Dr. Bernstein, I want to talk, turn it over to you to talk to us about testing. Thank you, Michael, and welcome, everyone. So during and after last week's seminar, as Michael said, we received a number of questions about COVID-19 testing, and they center around what's available, when will they be available, how do they work, and can pharmacists administer the tests, and more. To stay on top of what's available, APHA has some resources on our coronavirus guide for pharmacists under training and resources, so I encourage you to check there. Though, the primary resource is FDA's website. FDA is constantly updating which tests are approved under an EUA. Currently, there are 22 that are tests that are approved under an emergency use authorization or EUA. 
And none of these tests are approved for home use. So if you get offers for that, they are not approved. So what is an EUA? An EUA is a special authority in the law under which the FDA may allow unapproved medical products or unapproved uses of approved medical products to be used in an emergency to diagnose, treat, or prevent serious or life-threatening diseases or conditions caused by a threat, and including an outbreak such as COVID, when there are no adequate approved and available alternatives. So for some medical products, FDA has issued an EUA, and those are listed on their website. FDA has also provided flexibility and is allowing the development distribution and sale of certain, and let me underscore certain, tests and test kits if the tests have been validated and if FDA is notified, and then there are a number of other specific qualifiers and limitations on the different types of tests. In some cases, an EUA may be um, requested so that you have to submit an EUA. In other cases, it's not required. And if you have a question of whether a test is legitimately being marketed, check FDA's website. It's important to note that the test may not necessarily be approved or cleared, but FDA is aware that it's being marketed under their policy. So you these companies have to notify FDA. There's a lot of confusion in the marketplace, and you can easily be misled into thinking that a test kit being offered to, to you um, is legitimate. But if it's not on FDA's website, it's most likely not legitimate. So the, so the, going to the next test, the next slide, please. The coronavirus pandemic has created a new epidemic of fraud and scams, preying on the vulnerability of the public who are hungry for treatments, tests, and personal protective equipment. So these schemers offer unsafe, unproven, phony, and sometimes harmful products with no regard for public health and safety. This slide so, shows some herbal products that claim to be used for COVID, vaccines that are offered for sale even though no vaccine is approved. The tests in this picture were seized by authorities as they were found attempting to be imported into the US. It's really easy to put a clear liquid in a vial, label it a COVID test, and pretend it's a legitimate test. Um, counterfeit and substandard masks claiming to be N95 um, have been found, um, and those are found widely on the internet. And as pharmacists, we need to be aware of the fraudulent products and scams so we don't fall victim and we are able to warn our patients as well. Offers for fake and fraudulent products are all over the internet. Would you buy a vaccine from the WHO and pay just $4.95 for shipping? I don't know if you can see this, um, but that's what this offer on the left is asking. It just sounds too good to be true. And their website makes it look like the Today Show endorses. In fact, last week, the Department of Justice got a temporary restraining order shutting down this website. Um, and as you already probably familiar with a lot of the phony Canadian online pharmacies, online that typically offer lifestyle drugs or other drugs for chronic uses. Now they're all turning to sell anti-malarial and antiviral drugs for COVID. On the next slide, um, you could see Alibaba, which is one of the largest online commerce markets in the world, where you can buy anything and it's fraught with fake and some standard products. A search just conducted yesterday by the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies, I had them look for hydroxychloroquine bulk active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API. It revealed numerous sellers. This is one of the most in-demand APIs in the world because, as you all know, it's being touted as a possible treatment. Who made this? Under what conditions was it made? Was it what's in this powder? Who knows? This is not a reputable source for ingredients. And compounding pharmacists looking for API, be very cautious. Online auction platforms, you know, such as eBay, are also a breeding ground of fraudulent products. Here's what a search of N95 masks turned up. Whether these are N95 is unknown, probably not. 
the Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Federal Communications Commission have all issued warnings and taken action against fraud. FDA and FTC have issued, have issued warning letters against dietary supplement and drug product distributors that make us unsubstantiated and false and misleading claims. FTC also sent warning letters against voice over internet providers and other companies for illegal telemarketing and robocalls. FDA and FTC, they issue warning letters to entities when they find they are violating the law. And typically, FDA and FTC will require that violative company to respond within a certain amount of time. And if they don't, then the agencies might take further action, like getting a court order to shut them down or impose fines. But we're seeing more and more of these alerts and announcements and warning letters coming out of the agencies. The next slide. An indication that scammers are rampant on the internet is evidenced by how many new domain names with COVID, corona, virus, and other terms are registered. 100,000 COVID-related domain names were registered just in March of 2020. They were used to sell products, and as domains are identified in like when you get spam emails, and these are the different domains that are identified in those spam emails for COVID scams. And COVID-related phishing schemes are on the rise. Phishing is a cyber crime. It's where the targets are contacted or by email, telephone, or text messages by someone posing as a legitimate institution to lure you into providing sensitive data, such as personally identifiable information, or banking cards or, or passwords. So these are another indication that all of this fraud is on fraud is on the rise. The next slide. FCC has shared examples of phone scams that they're seeing, offers to buy fake test kits. There's also the scam of a caller claiming to be a government official from the CDC seeking payment to reserve vaccine when it's available. Non-delivery schemes are when the scammer gets your money and runs. That's what these are. FTC has even created a bingo card to help people identify the different types of schemes. And there's also a scam where a website or an app claims to be able to help you determine if your symptoms might be COVID um, and if you should get go get tested. These fraudulent websites and apps collect your personal details and personal health information for mischievous purposes and just sell that information. Next slide. So what does this mean for you as a pharmacist? It's important for you to be aware of these schemes and scams so you don't unsuspectingly fall prey to these offers and so you can warn your patients. It also helps you ask your patients targeted questions if they're describing unexpected side effects from drugs or unexplained symptoms. There are some red flags that, you sh that should make you pause and question the credibility of the offer. So does the offer seem too good to be true? Red flag. There are no products that cure or prevent COVID. FDA has not cleared or authorized any home tests, and no test will provide immediate results. And take a breath and pass on any offer for hydroxychloroquine API, since it's in very limited supply. If someone offers you a product that's in shortage in the U.S., red flag. You have to wonder where they got that product. It's likely from the gray market, and it could be diverted, expired, counterfeit, or other unapproved products. If you get offers that come via fax or cold calls or emails from people or companies who you haven't done business with before, red flag. If you receive an offer with personal testimonials that say how wonderful the product is with oftentimes really outrageous claims, another red flag. Most legitimate products don't typically include these types of testimonials. And if the offer asks for patient health information, big red flag. As you know, there are laws that protect patient health information and legitimate vendors know this. Next slide. So first and foremost, here are some, so here are some tips on how to protect your pharmacy and patients. And first and foremost, be informed, stay informed, and fact check. Uh, every day brings new developments, opportunities, and challenges. And if you're offered a medical product or service, 
check to see if the product is approved or cleared by FDA or if it's an, if it's an under an EUA. The web pages to check are listed here on this slide. Check to see if the product is on the drug shortage list. Drugs that are in shortage are more vulnerable for mischief by rogue actors in the marketplace. And if the product is in shortage, look for the red flag to tell if it's a legitimate product or offer. The other important thing to remember is know your source. For drugs under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, you can only purchase from authorized trading partners. And that incorporates this kind of good business practice of knowing who you're doing business with into law. But regardless, do your due diligence. If this is a new seller, check out references and find out more about the source of the product that they are offering. Next, protect patient information. Some programs or services now have a digital health component. Some are legitimate, some aren't. Check out the source of the program or service before providing personal health information. If there's a concern or lack of transparency of the source, most likely it's a scam. And practice smart online safety. Don't click on links from questionable sources. Many of you have taken IT security training that's required by your work, um, but when you're desperate for answers, like we all are now, you may let your guard down. Just take a pause and think before clicking. And if you suspect that an offer for a medical product or a medical product is fraudulent, counterfeit, or a scam, report it to FDA, FTC, or, and or FCC. They all have specific portal, portals or email links on their websites that enable you to easily file reports. And a lot of them are, can be found specifically on their COVID websites right now. So next slide. So now let's test what you just heard. So you receive the following email offer in co an email offering COVID-19 tests for your patients. Should, should you accept this offer? So take a look at the offer. I'll give you a second to read it. Okay. So yes or no, should you accept the offer? How's the polling doing? Oh, are you are you polling? Yes, it looks like we've got uh, nearly 65% uh, of our attendees have participated so far. Everyone oh, just- Oh, good. And, okay, go ahead. Do you want to report the results? 99% of people said no. Elisa, I think they got your message. <laughs> Good answer. Let, let's just let, let's go back to if you could go back to that slide, please, with the um, the offer. There it is. Okay. So let me just kind of walk you through to summarize. So this is an unsolicited email, red flag, from an unknown sender or source, red flag. They don't even mention what product is being offered, and and. And some of the offers that I've seen that some of you are getting, it's it's very similar like this. That pre-order, we have the we have the availability to get the test, and they don't even mention in there what the specific test is. So red flag. They're asking you for money up front. Red flag. This is possibly and probably a non-delivery scheme. Right now, there are no test kits with immediate results. Red flag. Test kits are, are not exempt from FDA approval, red flag. And here's the, the click here link, just don't click. So um, thank you for, for listening and I'm gonna send it back to you, Michael. Well, thanks so much, Elisa. What great information. I know this has been something that everybody has had so many questions about and been, bar been bombarded uh, with questions about this. Now, before we get into questions, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, we are so pleased today uh, to share with you all some breaking information that has not been shared elsewhere. Uh, you will be hearing this information first. 
Uh, Dr. Lisa Coonan, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for our audience, Dr. Coonan is providing support to CDC's COVID-19 emergency response. She serves as the lead for partners in healthcare systems and the coordination team at the CDC and has had a very long career at CDC and with HHS. Uh, uh, Lisa, share with us this late breaking information for healthcare professionals, pharmacists and pharmacy staff in particular. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be with you today. Michael, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Great. So we put together some new guidance. Um, the title of it is Considerations for Pharmacies in the COVID-19 Pandemic. It will be posted today, if not shortly, um, but I did want to take the opportunity and was invited by uh, APHA to get on this webinar and give you a little bit of an uh, overview. Um, CDC recognizes that pharmacies play a very important role and a vital part of the healthcare system, and ensuring co continuous functioning of pharmacies during this pandemic is important for communities, patients, and the nation. So we have prepared these guidances to assist you as you navigate your way through this pandemic. Um, I know that pharmacy staff are doing everything that they can to serve patients, and uh, I want to express my appreciation and gratitude for that. Uh, this guidance covers four main topics. Um, I'm going to go over it kind of in, in overview format, and then when the guidance is posted later today, I will send a link to Michael and uh, other leaders at APHA so they can distribute it to you. So the first piece of it is advising staff who are sick to stay home making sure that pharmacy staff who have fever or any respiratory symptoms stay home and away from the workplace until they have recovered. And CDC has very specific guidance about that on our web. The second part is about filling prescriptions. And although the actual process of preparing medications for dispensing is not a direct patient care activity, we know that other parts of medication dispensing, such as prescription intake, patient counseling, and patient education could expose pharmacy staff to individuals who have respiratory illness. So we have outlined a couple of steps um, to make sure that there can be as much physical distancing as possible, including encouraging all prescribers to submit their prescription orders via telephone or electronically, um, not handling benefit or insurance cards, Instead, having the customer take a picture of the card for processing or read aloud the information that's needed, um, preferably in a private location so other customers cannot hear. Uh, again, if uh, objects have been touched that have been handled by customers, then we recommend hand washing or use of hand sanitizer. And also strategies to minimize the close contact between staff and customers and between customers. And we know that a lot of the pharmacies are doing this already in terms of maintaining social distancing for people who are entering the pharmacy, using signage barriers and floor markers to instruct waiting customers to remain six feet back from the counter and from each other. Uh, some pharmacies are installing uh, sections of clear plastic uh, material so that there can be a barrier protection at the counter frequently cleaning and disinfecting all customer service counters and customer contact areas. If a pharmacy has a co-located retail clinic, using signs to ask customers and patients who have respiratory symptoms to wait for their appointment in a specific part of the store, and then promoting the use of self-serve checkout registers and cleaning them frequently. In addition, administrative controls include uh, diverting as many customers as possible to either drive through windows, curbside pickup, or home delivery when feasible by using signage on the doors and outside the pharmacy to ask people to do that. And also including in any text or automated telephone messages that ask people to come and pick up their prescriptions, uh, first of all, to advise sick people to send someone in their stead and also to use these alternative delivery methods. Uh, some pharmacies may want to limit the number of customers in the pharmacy at a given time 
to prevent crowding at the counter or at the check-in areas. And then pharmacists who are providing uh, patients with chronic disease management, medication management services, and other counseling uh, might be able to do some of that by telephone, telehealth, or telepharmacy strategies. And then finally, we have a section on COVID-19 testing. Um, pharmacies that are participating in the legitimate public health testing for COVID-19 should communicate with their local and state public health staff to determine which persons meet the need for criteria for testing, and also about how to collect, store, and ship specimens. And we do have some links in there for that, as well as for infection control guidance for pharmacy staff that are conducting COVID-19 testing. I'll go ahead and stop there and say that we hope that this guidance can be useful and instructive during this outbreak. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them during the question session. Back to you, Michael. Thank you so much, Lisa. Appreciate that information. And uh, last week, uh, for those of you who were with us, you know that we spent uh, the entire webinar talking about uh, safety and security in the pharmacy setting. And uh, APHA staff and leadership have been working closely with the CDC to get uh, uh, the guidance out uh, that we're hearing of today. So we, we're really appreciative of this. Now I wanna go over our instructions for our Q&A period. Um, we're going to uh, use the questions field on the GoToWebinar toolbar to submit comments and questions related to the topic discussion first. We'll spend a few minutes on the topic discussion and then as you'll know, uh, a little later, we'll also have just open forum for us to discuss anything. But let's keep our questions initially uh, to the topics of testing and also to safety and security in the pharmacy given Lisa's uh, late breaking presentation. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the questions that have been submitted and we will unmute uh, the line of the question asker and you'll have up to 60 seconds to be able to ask your question live. Uh, if uh, we're not being rude, we're setting a time limit so we can handle as many questions as possible. So please be brief in articulating your question and we'll, uh, we'll go through these questions uh, as best we can. So I'm going to start with a question from um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kafil Uden. He asked a question about uh, the spread of coronavirus through the air. Uh, and um, so uh, Dr. Uden, can you uh, ask your question, please? Brian, uh, we'll unmute his line. It looks like Dr. Uden has not entered his audio pin. Okay, Dr. Uden, I, I'll ask your question for you and uh, so we can move on. Uh, Ann Zlot, how about you answer this question for us? Is coronavirus spread by air? Is it spread, uh, air, is it aerosolized? What do we know about that? Is there new information? All right. Thank you, Michael. This is a great question and one that we've been getting um, frequently from uh, a lot of pharmacists across the country. So the information here is still evolving, um, but there is increasing evidence that, yes, um, coronavirus can be aerosolized. Um, that's somewhat preliminary. There was a great paper that came out from the Rocky Mountain Laboratories, which is a, a division of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And they did some great work that showed pretty clearly, at least to my reading, um, that the virus can, in fact, be aerosolized in small droplets. There was another article that came out uh, in JAMA, in JAMA Open, uh, that looked at um, actually sort of the air fluid dynamics of um, sneezes. And they showed um, that you can actually get very fine aerosolization um, of the liquids that come out when we sneeze, and that those can hang around in the air for a while. So if you put those two things together, there's increasing evidence, but not 100% confirmed evidence that um, the virus can be aerosolized and that that may be an important um, factor for transmission of coronavirus. So I'm, I'm gonna say that again, there's a little bit of a caveat there. That's somewhat hypothesis and it's not been 100% confirmed. All right, that's great. Thank you for that answer. Uh, let's uh, take a question here from Jay Nadas uh, as a question about uh, Abbott's assay. Um, Jay, would you like to ask your question, and we'll ask uh, uh, we'll ask Lisa Bernstein to answer this. Hi, good afternoon, and I uh, hope everyone is doing well. 
Uh, basically, I know we've been we've been monitoring the FDA website on a daily basis as well to see what kind of new testing is available and, and if any of it's going to be extended to pharmacists. Uh, the one that seems most promising right now is the Abbott uh, test that's being conducted on the ID Now uh, machine. As there is in the uh, intended for use document, it talks about approved for patient care settings outside of clinical laboratory settings. Is APHR or anyone else looking at um, how to define that, and does that include pharmacists in a retail setting? Lisa Bernstein? Yep, hi. Thank, yes, thank you for, for your question. Yeah, this, this actually, we've heard this from a number of people because it's not specifically clear, and we did reach out to FDA and did hear that it does include pharmacies, and we are hoping that they will provide even specific clarification about that, but um, that's what we were told. Okay, and a related question here is from Sylvia Rabianette. Uh, Sylvia, we're going to unmute your line and allow you to ask your question, and I think I'll ask Dan Zlot to answer this question. The line's unmuted. Sylvia? Sylvia, we can't hear you. Is your line muted on your end? Okay, we're not hearing you. I'm going to ask her question again. Uh, the question is, are there training guidelines for testing in the pharmacy? I mean, how if pharmacists have not been doing these tests uh, and we may be called upon to do them, how, how are we going to be trained to do this? Can you tell us about that, Dan? Absolutely. So. I'm going to take myself off speakerphone just to try to minimize the echo. However, um, are there training guidelines for this? There are not general guidelines, but I will say that there are training programs that are available and being created. When you think about training for uh, specimen collection, there are a number of things that you want to keep in mind. Number one is specimen collection technique. Uh, each of these tests have different acceptable samples that can be used as specimens, whether that's a nasopharyngeal swab, a nasal swab, oral pharyngeal swab, uh, or even uh, in the future potentially finger stick based tests, kind of like a glucometer, something akin to like a glucometer. Um, so that's the first thing you want to know is what's the proper technique for collecting specimens. The next piece of information you need to know is how to use whatever machinery um, you're working with. So if you happen to be somewhere where you're offering point-of-care-based testing, like an Abbott-based um, platform, um, you need to know how to use that machine fully. If you are partnering with a lab where you'll actually be sending specimens off to the lab for processing, you need to know proper specimen handling and storage procedures. And incredibly important, especially in this day and age, is also being trained on the appropriate use of personal protective equipment, understanding what personal protective equipment you need in order to safely collect specimens and being trained to properly don or put on and doff or take off PPE. Those are all the elements that I would consider to be essential in a training uh, program. Um, we are developing training programs here at APHA and we've partnered with um, several large groups uh, to uh, hopefully develop or provide some of that training to pharmacists out there in the field. So keep an eye on this space. I suspect it will continue to evolve rapidly. Okay, great. Um, let's take a question here from, uh, uh, we've got several questions actually about personal protective equipment and uh, the pharmacy. And I wonder, uh, Lisa, would you uh, be willing to give us a little bit of guidance on this? I'm going to unmute the line of Starlin Hayden greeting to ask the question. There's several people that have asked about PPE. Starlin, would you ask your question on behalf of everyone? Yes, um, thank you. And thank you for doing this. We are getting a lot of questions and I've been trying to help uh, organize this and, and are glued to the CDC websites. And as each phase comes out, we get a different impression. And so it would be nice to know for community pharmacy, um, who's on the front line, what your recommendations are for that sort of, of using, particularly face masks. Secondly, if, if, if you have had a person visit your pharmacy or drive dro drive through your pharmacy that possibly is positive what are the um, face mask um, 
uh, rules that you're going by. Right now, people are leaning toward that if you have a fever or their respiratory um, symptoms to self-mask so that you don't spread the germs. That's, that's, that's not a rule or a guideline. That's just what some people are doing in, in the field. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question, and there are lots of parts to it, so let me try to, to help. Um, when this pharmacy guidance is posted later today or soon, you'll find some links specifically about uh, that, and so I encourage you to look at it. Be the major thrust here is that it, there is not a recommendation for pharmacy staff to wear PPE uh, when filling prescriptions or dispensing of prescriptions to patients. Rather, it's using the social distancing, the barriers, um, good hand washing, and so forth. That's one. Number two, yes, um, masking a person who's symptomatic, source control, that is something that is recommended. Um, and, but as I said before, if at all possible, if you can advise patients who are ill not to enter the pharmacy, but rather to pick up their medicines through drive through curbside delivery or home delivery, that would also reduce the risk of exposure. Um, doing testing does require PPE, and there's very specific guidance for that. Um, so let me just stop there and say that 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 is what we're recommending. Okay, great. That's good information. So uh, um, uh, I also want to just comment yesterday, I believe it was, or maybe it was the day before yesterday, uh, there was a CDC official on national television who made some general comments that I'm not sure were a CDC policy. It's a little uncertain about, uh, you know, people considering wearing even homemade masks potentially if they're going to be in public and around others. Um, and so the issue of homemade masks has come up frequently in the pharmacy community, Lisa. Uh, what I'm hearing at our health center is that homemade masks at least offer uh, a bit of a barrier protection, but also can offer a false sense of security and that we can't let our guard down on social distancing if we're using those. Could, could you comment just briefly about that issue of, of masking routinely in the consumer public? I know we've had a few county governments and county health departments in California that have now made a recommendation to use those things. So could you speak about that at all or are comfortable speaking about that? Yeah, let me say a couple of things. First of all, as everyone knows, this is a rapidly evolving event, and every day we are learning more about the virus, its impact on people, its transmissibility, as was previously mentioned, and also about what we should be doing to protect each other. This issue of um, community mask use is in heavy discussion right now about what the recommendation might be. Um, I don't believe a decision has been made at this moment, but I do know that it is being carefully considered. So stay tuned uh, because every day we're putting up new guidance on our website. Every day we're learning more and uh, we're trying to be nimble and, re and responsive to the influx of all this information coming in, informing us so people can protect themselves. So okay. I, I would just say to you that that decision has not been made yet. It's very dynamic, though, and, and it is in heavy discussion. So something we need to pay attention to. So we're going to look carefully yes. at that and very, very, very important. Um, I've got a, a question here. This is a quasi-legal question and a quasi-safety uh, question. It's a little bit of everything. Uh, Dr. Randall Deal Sr. is on the line. Dan, uh, Dr. Deal, would, uh, we're going to unmute your line and let you ask your question. Okay. Uh, Brian, you can mute his line. I'll go ahead and ask the question on his behalf. The question is, will a pharmacy be liable if a pharmacy associate gets COVID-19 and they did not implement the safety recommendations, such as to keep front window to keep front windows closed, only do pickup and drive through car pickup, and only accept prescriptions electronically. Uh, what liability concerns are there during this time? Uh, this is an interesting question. Probably crosses uh, a couple of uh, of uh, areas. Um, I'm happy to have both Lisa and Elisa respond to this. Uh, I will comment before we even answer this question that uh, 
The American Pharmacist Association is not your legal counsel. This is something that you would ultimately want to discuss with your uh, legal counsel. Uh, we will give opinions on this matter, but we cannot uh, represent you on this matter uh, from a legal perspective, but I'm happy to have Elisa and Lisa comment. Lisa, Lisa, Coonan, why, Lisa Coonan, why don't you kick us off and then Elisa Bernstein. Okay. I, uh, let me just say this. I'm not an attorney and I have no information or opinion about it, but I will say that um, it's going to be very hard to pinpoint the source of infection for a given person. Right now, we have tens of thousands of people who are ill in this country, and for about 96 or 97 percent of them, there's no uh, traceable contact that they can uh, be aware of that would cause their illness. Lisa Bernstein, do you want to comment? Yeah, sure, though I will say I am a lawyer, but I uh, I, I appreciate the qualifier that you gave earlier about that we are not the lawyers, but for for you all. However, and I can't really answer that other than saying it depends, as most lawyers will. Um, it depends on what the legal responsibility is in for that state. It depends if there's you know federal or state requirements. Are they followed? Um, and there are a whole number of different issues that would go into this in addition to what Lisa said. So it, it is something to, um, to be aware of, but I can't really give you an answer one way or another. Okay, great. We've got a question here. I'm, I'm gonna shift now uh, to our open forum to talk about any subject beyond the ones that we had covered in today's presentations. And this next question uh, gets into this, uh, gets into a little bit different area. Uh, I'm going to ask that the staff unmute the line of Chanel Hill. Uh, Chanel Hill, would you like to please ask your question about vaccines? Her line is unmuted. Dr. Hill, please, please ask your question. Um, I was just asking because we're we're being told to still give shots to people and we're actually being pushed to give vaccines and a lot of us don't feel comfortable giving vaccines so i was asking is there should we still be giving people back vaccines right now okay um uh, dr coonan would you like to respond first and we can take other comments thank you um we are actively pursuing that we recognize that elective procedures uh well checks preventive uh, uh, diagnostic tests are all being postponed right now because of this outbreak and uh, this is under consideration. Uh, if we um, come up with um, a statement on that, I will add that to the guidance for pharmacies that uh, we're gonna post today, but I don't have that decision right now, but just to say it, it is under active discussion. All right, thank you so much for that comment. Um, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Alan Nickel, uh, we're going to unmute your line. Can you uh, ask your question, please? It looks like Alan has not entered the audio pin for me to unmute his line. Alan, uh, I'll ask your question here for you, and I'm going to ask uh, Elisa Bernstein to answer this one. Uh, there is a manpower shortage in healthcare workers. That's there's no doubt about that. Uh, is APHA working with HHS uh, to have some sort of an administrative action uh, for pharmacists to be added to the provider list? Can can uh, Elisa Bernstein give us an update on that issue? Yes, I'm I'm happy to. Thank you. Yeah. You know, so you know we are working on all fronts to influence policymakers to make this happen. You know, APHA, we continue to be a leader advocating for you, the pharmacists, for provider status, you know, particularly as, as you note that the healthcare system is stressed and pharmacists are here and able and trained and ready to, to do more. Um, we did reach out to, a few weeks ago, we reached out to the White House Task Force specifically on this issue. We have band together with our pharmacy coalition, our national organizations. Um, we issued a joint statement uh, just, I think it was about two weeks ago, about 10 days ago, 
something like that. Um, and we've used that statement that has the full weight behind pharmacy to advocate to the White House, to CMS, and Congress. Um, we tried to get provider status in the last economic stimulus package. And thank you for all of you, as, as you may have received the request, um, if you're an APHA member or a member of other national pharmacy organizations, to send letters to members of Congress. Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't get added, but you all came out in full force. We are actively working to get this included in the next package or any other opportunity that comes up, particularly on the Hill. But we also are continuing to work closely with CMS HH, and HHS on, um, on opportunities for provider status for pharmacists. Okay. Um, we had a question come in and the, and the asker of the question does not have audio capability. So he's asked that I, uh, Paul Daniels has asked if I ask this question, if a pharmacy employee tests positive for the virus and the staff does not have personal protective equipment, is it the CDC's current guidance that the coworkers who are working with that positive patient need to be subject to a 14 day self quarantine without personal protective equipment? Uh, Dr. Coonan, this is an interesting question that maybe you can help us clarify. I know there's information on CDC's website about this. There is, and it is uh, evolving, but um, just a couple of, of rubrics. First of all, as everyone uh, heard me say before, uh, sick employees should not be reporting to work. Of course, that can happen that someone come to work feeling fine and then develop symptoms once they're there. Because this outbreak is evolving in many different ways in different communities, I would suggest consulting with local public health about their recommendation and also checking our website. Okay, great. That's good information. And I, I will uh, direct the question asker that there is a rubric on the CDC's website and we provided the link as part of last week's links uh, that will give you a, a sort of a stair step rubric on how to make those decisions about whether a person is low risk, medium risk or high risk uh, based upon exposure. And now that we have community-based uh, transmission, um, that uh, is important to be following that rubric. So thank you for that question. Right, we're gonna take uh, two or three more questions here as we have a, a ability to do so. We've gotten, folks, dozens and dozens of questions, and I apologize if we don't get to your question specifically. Uh, we're, we're doing our best and we'll keep these questions and, and try to address them over the course of the, of the week. Um, Let's um, uh, let's look here at a question on um, Chris Federico. Could you speak to this one? Uh, looks like you've got something here about contact tracing. Uh, can you uh, ask your question, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think my main question comes down to many states are suggesting that employees or just individuals in general are recording who they've interacted with throughout the day so for better contact tracing so if you work in a pharmacy it's incredibly challenging to to do that for people that come to drive through and pick up so how would you suggest employees actually execute that so um michael do, this is lisa coonan do you want me to take the first stab at this Please. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, employees who are working with drive through should have the six foot distance between them and the person where so that social distancing should not uh, mean that they've had close contact. Um, and as communities move more and more into widespread community spread, contact tracing is probably going to be less of an, a, a mandate than it is now. Um, so again, it's really going to vary on um, local conditions. So please do check with, with local public health. Uh, Richard Dang has a clarifying question about uh, COVID point of care tests and home kits. Uh, Richard, would you like to ask your question, please? Just get some clarification on this. Hi, yeah, so there are some COVID point of care tests or home kits that are looking at things like IgG and IgM. Um, and some of their companies have stated that they do not fall under the FDA's emergency use authorization. 
I just wanted to get any insider clarification into those statements. Hey, Lisa Bernstein, can you answer that? Yeah, well, home kits don't fall under the enforcement discretion, the policy. So FDA has issued a policy related to different types of tests. And, they, and, and for those tests, there's some flexibility. What FDA has said is that home test kits do not fall under that flexibility and, they, and that you have to work with FDA in order to um, move forward or get some sort of clearance or approval, whether it's under an EUA or not for home test kits. So I think you know, some, some um, offers are out there saying that they don't need the approval, but it's really, it's a mis misunderstanding or it's a misinterpretation or of, of that um, provision under the policy that FDA is providing. Great, thanks for that. And um, uh, let's take one last question. Um, let's, uh, uh, this, this question is gonna be a tough one, I think, to answer, but uh, uh, we'll hopefully do our best. Um, is there any return to work guidance? So let's say that a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician tests positive for COVID-19 and is convalescing uh, from COVID-19. Uh, would one of our panelists like to tell us about when it is safe for that individual to return to work? Hi, this is Lisa Kunin from CDC. There is guidance on CDC's website about that. Um, and um, I, I can send a link to that, but basically um, if a person has not been tested, uh, the, the general guidance is that they had no fever for at least 72 hours, three full days, symptoms have improved, and at least seven days have passed since the first symptoms appeared. If they are, are going to be tested, then uh, they also have to be um, fever-free other symptoms improved and two negative tests uh, in a row 24 hours apart. So there is guidance on the website for that um, and um, specifically for people working in healthcare environments. Uh, like I said, I'll be glad to send the link. Great. Okay, well, I tell you what, I, I, we've got so many questions. I wish we could go for another hour, but we can't. I'd like to summarize a few things before we uh, close out our program today. Don't log off just yet. Some important information for you. Brian, if we can advance the slides, I want to cover a couple things that APHA has been working on and some things you can look for. Uh, first of all, there's been a couple of new episodes of uh, of uh, APHA's 15 on COVID, and uh, these are 15 minute uh, CE opportunities for continuing education available through pharmacist.com. One is on NSAIDs and their use during COVID-19. Been a lot of confusion about that out there in the marketplace. And then also about ACE inhibitor and ARB therapy in COVID-19, some confusion about that as well uh, in the marketplace, given some of the mechanisms uh, that uh, the medicines that are being targeted for treatment uh, are, are using. So I just point you to those. On the next slide, I wanna point out a few advocacy things that are going on. Uh, first of all, APHA has communicated with OSHA um, this week uh, to clarify protections for pharmacists and pharmacy staff as frontline providers. Uh, OSHA has published a COVID-19 guide and we've provided a link to that, but just to let you know, APHA is advocating with OSHA to give some clarification about specific protections that they think should be in place for pharmacists and pharmacy staff. So I would just uh, let you know we're working on that. APHA also sent joint comments to the FDA urging flexibility for pharmacists related to compounded products, especially those that are at risk of shortage so that uh, pharmacists can do some compounding of those products uh, when there's maybe API available, but not solid dosage forms from manufacturers and as well as the alcohol-based sanitizers. And then lastly, uh, you may have seen that APHA, uh, together with the American Medical Association and ASHP, jointly issued a statement 
based upon feedback we got, overwhelming feedback from pharmacists about inappropriate ordering, prescribing, and dispensing of medicines to treat COVID. So those are things that we've done to try to be very responsive uh, to the marketplace. On the next slide, uh, just would share with you also uh, that uh, there's some additional COVID resources that uh, we continue to post on pharmacist.com, some basics and so forth. Uh, and then on the next slide, uh, you should also know that there are publicly available resources uh, for all pharmacists uh, to be able to access through pharmacist.com. Uh, when you log into pharmacist.com, at the very top banner, just click on that COVID-19 uh, banner and it takes you into a variety of different resources that are available to the profession. I want to encourage you all to continue to send emails uh, to us uh, continue communicating through the APHA Engage platform. Uh, APHA Engage is our members uh, communication platform and we have uh, 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 active dialogue going on with pharmacists who are providing care in this environment. Uh, we love to get your questions. It helps us to identify topics for these weekly webinars. And it also helps us to hear your personal stories about uh, what's going on in practice uh, so that we can be the very best we can be at advocating at state legislatures and in Washington, D.C. for the things that you need to be your best and to keep pharmacists and pharmacy personnel safe. I want to also just acknowledge that it's been inspiring for me personally, and I know for many in our profession, to see the public acknowledgement of the important role of pharmacists from governors, uh, from the media. Uh, we've just seen a overwhelming uh, positivity from the public about the important role that you play, and we thank you for that. I will just point out to you that we will, in fact, have this webinar posted within 24 hours online so that uh, your friends who weren't able to join today will be able to watch it. We will announce the timing for next week's webinar tomorrow, and you'll be able to enroll in that. It'll actually be at the same time. Uh, but you'll need to enroll and register for that webinar, but that'll be posted tomorrow through APHA's regular communication vehicles, and we'll do it at the same time in the same place. We really do hope that all of you can join us for that webinar. Uh, as we wrap up today, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lisa Coonan, for joining us from the S uh, CDC here at the last minute today. We appreciate you sharing your late-breaking information with us. I want to thank also APHA staffers, Elisa Bernstein, and also Dan Zlot for uh, taking questions today and helping us, and also the entire APHA staff who's working tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that pharmacists have the resources that they need day in and day out uh, to be able to do what you do in providing optimal patient care. Thank you everyone for all that you're doing and we'll look to speak with you again next week, same time, same place. God bless.